Welcome to Hacking Your Leadership. I'm Chris, and welcome to today's guest interview. Our guest interviews are long-form interviews for leaders from around the world. They've each been selected because of their valuable perspective on leadership and work they've accomplished in this space. Today, we're joined by Doug Conant, former CEO of Campbell Soup Company, former president of Nabisco Foods, and author of the book Blueprint, Six Practical Steps to Lift Your Leadership to New Heights, a book that has been praised by thought leaders like Adam Grant and Amy Edmondson, people we reference in the Hacking Your Leadership podcast pretty regularly. Welcome, Doug. Say hi to our audience. Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here this morning. I appreciate it. Um, would you mind giving us a little bit of a, a, a brief history about your your career journey in a nutshell? In a nutshell, 25 words or less? Perfect. <laughs> uh, no, I... Uh... I went to undergraduate and graduate school at Northwestern University a thousand years ago and went into brand management and worked for uh, General Mills and uh, Kraft. Ultimately, I ended up uh, at Nabisco right after Barbarians at the Gate. Uh, some of the, your older listeners will remember that. It was became a famous book about the world's largest LBO with KKR. I was there for a decade. The last five years, I was president of Nabisco Foods Company, recruited into Campbell Soup Company on the heels of a major meltdown with that company, uh, and which was headquartered in the poorest, most dangerous city in the United States, Camden, New Jersey. 75,000 people, 70 murders a year, a world headquarters surrounded by razor wire and guard stands. And uh, not what you would expect of a Fortune 500 company. And then I, uh, I retired from there and uh, ultimately went on to become uh, chairman of Avon Products in New York. And uh, along the way, I've also been deeply involved in, in the nonprofit world and uh, in teaching. And that's what I'm doing now. I'm supporting many nonprofits and, uh, and I'm teaching both in Boston and in my own leadership development program in Philadelphia. A lot of your time in the workforce was spent in companies that had to do that have to do with food. Um, it, is that just coincidentally because that's where you happen to start out when you graduated college and that's where you stayed because that's what you ended up knowing? Or, or did something draw you to that industry? Well, actually, uh, I was drawn to it, uh, but it also happened to be uh, – you're too old. I'm too young, but uh, – you, you would remember maybe the movie The Graduate with Dustin Hoffman and Anne Bancroft, and she was seducing him and uh, as having just graduated from college. And in one scene around a pool, uh, and, uh, Dustin Hoffman is trying to decide, what am I going to do? I just graduated from college. I don't know what to do. A guy puts his arm around him and says, I have one word for you, one word, plastics, and says, you got to get into plastics. And uh, I had a professor at Kellogg who figuratively put his arm around me and said, I have two words for you, brand management. And he was the father of brand management, uh, Phil Kotler. He was my advisor. Uh, and he's, he wrote the ultimate book on brand man marketing and brand management to this day. And uh, so he steered me into brand management. The companies that were doing brand management at a world-class level happened to be consumer packaged goods companies. Uh, most notably food companies. So I ended up drifting into that arena because I was attracted by brand management and the food companies were doing it particularly well. So um, once I was there, I tried moving out of that industry for a while, got fired from a job and went straight back to it uh, because I decided to stick to my knitting. And, you know, the food industry is is a, a pretty cool industry to be associated with, uh, you know, it's a reap what you sow kind of industry, really well anchored in an American work ethic and uh, uh, and uh, closely connected to American farms. And I enjoyed the association with people who were working hard to put food on people's tables in a, in a responsible way. So I – I enjoyed the ride, and I ended up doing it for 40 years. I love that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to read a quote from your book here, and I want to kind of use that as, as a to respond to the, the answer you just gave. You said you kind of drifted into it. Um, a, a quote from your book says, you don't have to lead. You have a choice. The fact that you're leading is intentional, not incidental. So why have you made the choice to lead people? 
So I'm wondering, have you, did you drift into leadership or did you make a choice to lead people? I think there are a lot of leaders out there who they make a choice to get promoted. They make a choice that they want more money or more responsibility or more prestige or a better, you know, whatever, all the, all the good stuff. And, and by virtue of that, they have to end up leading people. And so they, they kind of drift into leading people. How, how did that work for you? The, the word uh, I'll use that is equivalent to drift is seat of the pants. Most of us lead our li- leadership lives by the seat of our pants. We react to what comes at us. We try and do the smartest thing in the moment, and we get through. Mm-hmm. And uh, I certainly did that the first uh, decade of my career. You know, I just went and did the next thing. And whatever they asked me to do, and I tried to figure it out and do it better than anybody else and uh, did the best I could. I reacted to what came at me, and I held my own. Ultimately, I got fired uh, doing that kind approaching my job that way, because if you I have found if you really want to excel at anything, I don't care what it is, if it's doing a podcast or uh, if you're an athlete and you want to excel in a sport or you're in theater and you want to excel at the theater, you have to bring a sense of intentionality to it. You got to work at it and you got to have a sense of purpose about it. It's got to be meaningful. And uh, so doing it by the seat of your pants is probably not the best way to approach doing a being a pro at doing podcasts and doing it, you know, teaching by the seat of your pants is probably not the best way to do it. Leading by the seat of your pants is definitely not the, the best way to do it, especially leadership. And I'll tell you why, because I view leadership as sacred ground. You're affecting people's lives. My gosh, they are working or thinking about doing work more than anything else they do. They wake up in the morning thinking about what they need to do and how they're going to squeeze their kids in while they do it. Then they go maybe to the second bedroom right now and they go work all day trying to figure out how to manage the kids. They take a little lunch break. They go back to it. They manage the kids again, walk the dog, and then they come back, have a little dinner. And then what do they do? They get right back on email again. And they're working through. Then they go to sleep thinking about what they have to do the next day. More of their waking hours are spent thinking about work than anything else they do. And you have a profound influence as the leader of these people on on their lives. You have to take that seriously. I just think it's just not good enough to do it by the seat of your pants. And not only that, but you can do it with a little intentionality. Uh, The point I make with most of the people I teach is, We're not trying to go from zero to 60 in two seconds here. If you're going to, you know, today, most of what I do, 70% of it is seat of the pants. Still, I got to react to what comes at me. Same with you when you're doing your podcast. But then there's a little 30% or 20% where I got to approach it with a sense of here's where I'm going and here's how I want to do it. You got to get, you got to be intentional. And uh, so I learned that the hard way because uh, I have my my favorite quote. Every year I pick a favorite personal quote. And as I did 2020 and launched the blueprint, uh, this was my favorite quote. And it was from Brene Brown. She, She would say, you can either walk inside your story and own it, or you can stand outside your story and hustle for your worthiness every, I would add, every day. And I was walking inside somebody else's story and hustling for my worthiness all the time. I was not walking inside my story because I'd never thought about my story. You know, I never approached it. This is my story. I need to own it. This is my story. This is how I want to walk in the world as a leader. So I was just bouncing around reacting to things just wasn't good enough. I found that when I became a little more intentional, I became a lot more effective. And that's the notion of the blueprint. It's we're going to help you get anchored in the leader you want to be, not what somebody else wants you to be. We're going to help you become more well anchored in the leader you want to be. And we're going to help you bring it to life in a way that makes you maybe 20 percent more intentional than you were before. And it will change your life. And by the way, you can do it in a few days. But you do have to. There's a caveat like there are with all uh, programs where you learn and grow is you have to, you have to stick to it and you have to get a, you have to bring a continuous improvement mindset to the work and says, well, that worked pretty well. What can I do a little bit better tomorrow? But, uh, 
this is this is a this is a really powerful notion that it, uh, you know I'm slow. It took me to the age of 69 to publish a book on this, as I was trying to figure it out for a good 40 years. Uh, fortunately, the people that get engaged in this work now don't have to spend 40 years to uh, to to get it. You know the the things you're talking about are systemic in nature, and I think they're they're cultural at least in the in the Western workforce. When you talk about this, you know, seat of your pants mindset, you know, go go find any job opening opening application or or, a, or listing on LinkedIn or Monster or jo- whatever job board you want at a director or vice president level, where clearly these are roles leading people, and the majority of the words talking about the role will be whatever the metric is you have to affect and whatever the 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 outcomes are that the company wants you to affect for them, and there's not a blurb at all or maybe a single line about the responsibility you have leading people, um, yeah, how most people couldn't go into a role like that with intentionality if the company that is hiring them isn't even taking it seriously. How do we fix that as a, as a systemic issue? I, I, I think that passing the buck, uh, you can look to the, you know, I have a friend that uh, had a wonderful quote. He said, Doug, there are 10 two-letter words, 10 two-letter words, that define the challenge you have in life. Ten two-letter words. If it is to be, it is up to me. This to say, well, the company's got to provide me direction. Give me a break. Where's that going to happen? You've got thousands and thousands of people all struggling to make it work. You have to take ownership over your own journey. I, as somebody I encourage you to get on your uh, show is she just published her book. I got it yesterday. It's Katrina Adams, uh, who was uh, the first African-American president of the uh, U.S. Tennis Association, and uh, her book is called Own It, And, uh, and, and, and she recognized she needed to own what she needed to do. If it was to be, it was up to her, and if you go into a company, you've got a group of people working for you. You can decide how you want to lead them. You can develop your own leadership philosophy that works for you. And and if with a little intentionality, you can think about how it will work within the four walls of that company. You know, I went to work in the world's largest LBO uh, and we had a report to the uh, investment bankers every month about how much our costs were and our revenue and all of our spending. Uh but that had nothing to do with running the company. It was all about people. When you're assigned a responsibility for getting something done through a lot of people, you quickly realize that if they're not engaged in the work, you're sunk. You're just sunk. You can't manage the task, in my opinion. You have to lead the people. And then the people have to manage the tasks. We now have very flat organizations. People tend to have a lot of direct reports because they delayered. Right. And now you've got all these people. And if you're trying to manage all those tasks, forget it. The key is to get these people fully engaged in the work so they can get the work done independently of you because they're all they have your back, knowing that you have their back. And so I would contend and I've learned it the hard way through, you know, going up, starting at the entry level at the bottom of the pyramid uh, and going up to being becoming a chairman. Uh, you're totally dependent on the engagement of other people to get your job done. And you're naive if you don't think that's the case. And you're at risk if you don't take their engagement very seriously. All the research, Gallup, who does the most research in employee engagement in the world, across all countries, all sectors, uh, would tell you, uh, people join a company, but they leave a manager. If you're not managing well, forget it, you're sunk. You're sunk and you have to manage them in a thoughtful way. My language is you cannot win in an enduring way in the marketplace unless you're first winning in the workplace and you got to be working, winning with people. It's all about the people. If you don't have you know, leaders need followers <laughs> and people have to decide they're going to follow in a, in a serious way as opposed to a passive aggressive way. It's just common sense. And uh, you can get away with almost anything in the short term. But ultimately, <laughs> in my experience, people have to have your back. 
and they have to trust you and believe in you and believe that you have their best interests at heart. And if, if, if you don't, you're going to have a very short career there. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know, it's very obvious to me. And I've been dealing with thousands of people who, who are struggling to make a difference. And, uh, and it's becoming obvious to them that they just can't manage all the tasks and all the crap that's coming at them. Pandemic, economic, social justice, you know, these tsunamis that are hitting them, boom, boom, boom. And at the same time, get the job done. They have to be tuned into the people that work for them in a unique and special way so that those people will do unique and special things for the enterprise and for them. I'm astounded that it doesn't make more sense to people and that people can't wrap their minds around that. I think one of the reasons it's hard for people to wrap their minds around it is because it's harder to measure in the moment whether or not you're being effective at it. You have to connect dots looking back and think and, and see kind of like, am, am I am I doing right by my people or, or, or see what they're trying to say? Yeah, I, I think that's good. And I would tell you, I think this is a place where you need to be intentional. You need to think about how do I want to walk in the world as a leader? Our whole book, The Blueprint, is geared to helping you build your own personal leadership model that speaks to you, that's informed by all your reflection, all your life experiences, and your study beyond the four walls of your life, and build what I call a leadership model that provides guides. Here's how I'm going to approach my work. In, in my case, I have, I have eight elements on this model. Just that, It's mine. And it doesn't work for some people, but I don't really care. It works for me. And at the center of my model, I have three center, three pieces that form the axle. And it's honor people, inspire trust, and clarify higher purpose. So whenever I'm dealing with you or anybody else, you're going to feel that I honored you, that I'm trust building with you, and that I have a sense of higher purpose. And then I have five elements that I always check in on about setting direction, aligning the organization, uh, building organization vitality, executing with excellence and producing results because, you know, this is a results oriented business. And it's not just about leading people and holding hands and singing kumbaya. It's about performance. You know, this whole conversation is about really two things, people and performance. You got to perform or you don't have a job. I mean, if you're a senior executive, typically, if you got a, if you, if you're really lucky, you got three years. The first year, it's the other guy's fault. He screwed it up. I'm doing the best I can. The second year, it's our fault. We're learning, but we see some green shoots of opportunity and things are getting better. By year three, you own it, right? So that 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 you got to perform. At the same time, while you're doing that, if you're not bringing your followers along, the people with you on the journey, you're going to find that by the time you're, in, you're getting into years two and year three. If you haven't respected those people and engaged them properly, they're not going to have your back. It's going to get to be a heavy load and you're at risk. You know, so ultimately, this is all about people and performance and also figuring out what's my story. Go back to Brene Brown. I want to walk inside my story. What's my leadership story? What does it look like? And you know what? We find that in two days, people will examine their lives and say, here are the people that made a big difference in my life. My grandfather had a profound influence on me. This one teacher was amazing. This one coach was amazing. I learned things from those people that really have stuck with me for my whole life. And then I've studied people around me that I'm really impressed by. And I've learned things from them. Now I'm going to build my little leadership model, which is going to speak to me in a way that every Every engagement I have, it, it can guide me in terms of how I want to show up. It makes it so much easier for leaders today. Yeah, the, the, the three elements you mentioned, they seem almost chronological too, meaning it's really difficult to inspire trust until you've already shown that you know how to honor people. Now, is that intentionally like that or do you, do you, do you view them chronologically? Well, I, I do. I, the, I, the, you know, I've, obviously, I've spent a lot of time uh, working on this virtually seriously since I first met Stephen Covey a thousand years ago in the 1990s. And I started thinking that I had to be more intentional. He would call it proactive. And uh, I thought, gee, I can do better at this than I'm doing it. And where I it was dawning on me that I was doing things by the seat of my pants. 
And, uh, uh, and so I've been working on this a long time, and it sort of does for me. That's the order for me. My premise is my go where I start is honoring people. Then I build the trust. Then I make sure people understand that I want to get through the night, but I do have a sense of higher purpose. And then I ultimately, I want them to know that as a leader, I know I have to perform. And we have to meet or exceed expectations. I believe that you can, another one of the things, Things that I've been uh, known for is this language about being tough-minded on standards of performance and tender-hearted with people. Most, when I started, you were you were supposed to be Vince Lombardi, tough with people, tough, tough, tough. Ah. And uh, and I, I I got that because you got to perform, and I was a competitive athlete. You got to perform, but I didn't ever see this. I didn't see that you couldn't do both. You couldn't. You could care about somebody. In fact, I do an exercise, uh, which I can uh, do real quickly right here with you. If you think about somebody who had the most profound influence on you in your life, uh, pick a. Uh, often it's very rarely a boss. It's usually a, a grandparent or a parent or an aunt, an uncle, a coach. If you think about that person, don't even have to name it. Name them. Uh, and then did they have high standards for you? Yes. Absolutely. Did they really care about you? Yes. And they had the most profound influence on you or one of the most profound influences on you in your life. They were tough-minded on standards and they were tender-hearted with you. And it worked in a way that you carry the, those lessons with you today. And all I'm trying to do in this whole exercise, we can make it complicated, is I'm telling people – you just need to be more like that person with the people with whom you live and work. You can do this. You've seen it work. Tough-minded on standards, tender-hearted with people, performance and people, and then do it in a way that's fulfilling to you, that honors the people that helped shape your life. And we find that in just a few days, we can knit this together in a way that all of a sudden you're, you're performing more like the leader you want to be. You're still tough on standards, but you're you've got more empathy and it's more fulfilling work, which sort of makes sense to me. Uh, so this is uh, uh, th th this is a different conversation, but I'm a very logical. I've got a real good left brain and uh, and it holds up to scrutiny. Yeah. One of the things that I always say in my own leadership journey is that I believe people desperately want to be held accountable. They just only want to be held accountable by people who genuinely care about their success. Those are the only people who have the credibility to hold them accountable. Yeah, and by the way, that happens very rarely. Ultimately, you have to be accountable to yourself. You have to be walking in your story, in your leadership model, in your leadership journey, knowing that the people you're working, look, I had 28 bosses, 28 bosses, three were good. I mean, think about it. I mean, they were three were really good. Twenty five were fair to poor. And of those bosses, their bosses, that makes it 56, 56 bosses. Maybe, maybe five were good in total. The rest were fair to OK. Not good enough. Just not good enough. So, you know, I'm thinking you can't ask companies to hold you. I mean. It, you can't be looking to companies or in other people to hold you to the highest standards. You have to set those standards for yourself, and then you have to find a way to knit them together in a way that works in harmony with the people with whom you're working. And it doesn't have to be perfect. As I said, I worked in a real tough environment at Nabisco uh, uh, after Barbarians at the Gate, and uh, uh, – I had to perform and I had to have people engaged in the work and we were able to do both those things in that culture, although nobody was encouraging us to do it that way. But if I was doing it their way, I wouldn't be where I am today. I would be still working out on the street trying to find my next job. You know, I, I, was, I was focused on honoring people, inspiring trust and clarifying a higher purpose while delivering results, being tough-minded on standards, but being very tender-hearted with people, 
the more challenging the situation, the more people need to know you care. And I mean, uh, you have to, you're accountable to yourself. The book that I'm, I'm, I'm going to encourage you to follow up with Katrina Adams is her title is own it. That's the title. You got to own this journey. And, and, and that's what I try and impart to these leaders. If you're putting yourself in this sea of victims world, oh me, you wouldn't believe what I'm going through. My boss and my company is so dysfunctional. Give me a break. You're going to be wallowing in that sea of victims world for your life. Pick a path. And by the way, you can be part of an enterprise and you can pick a path that's fulfilling and you can find a way to knit it together so that you can be productive in that enterprise. It's not tough. You've got to be tough minded on standards and you've got to be tender hearted with people. The concept of owning it is important from a standpoint of of feeling like you have control over it too. The moment you think the world is just happening to you, that's, that's got to be a, a really scary place to try to, to make your way in. The moment you can say to yourself that wherever I am is the, is, the, is the result of decisions that I make and the result of the relationships that I make and what I put into it myself, um, that is incredibly freeing if you allow it to be. It is, but you got to realize you are, I mean, it's not all or none here. I can't own my... It's serendipity. It is, uh, uh, you know, I've been a victim a lot of times. You know, I've been fired. I've been put in really awkward situations. I've, you know, I'm just like everybody else. Uh, but, you know, 30% of the time I'm being more intentional. And I'm finding a way to walk my path in a more fulsome way. And the more I do it, interestingly, the more fulfilling it is. And by the way, the better I get at it. So, you know, it is a tough world out there. And I'll tell you a funny story. We launched this book because it was a tough world and because I felt that leaders today were d doing the surface work, but they weren't building a strong enough foundation to deal with the challenges they were having to face. They really weren't well anchored in how they wanted to show up. And we launched this book the first week of March uh, into the pandemic. I had my grand opening on Park Avenue in New York on the first week of March. The second week of March, we started canceling the entire book launch. And, you know, we were saying, oh, woe is me. We're victims. You know, this this isn't fair. You know, we spent four years working on this book. Oh, poor us. Didn't, you know, that just does not help a lot. And uh, so we, 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 we realized that, Everybody was feeling more of like a victim than ever in my lifetime, quite frankly, between the pandemic, the economic uncertainty, the uh, uh, the social unrest. And then on top of that, the political rancor that occurred in the end of this last year, uh, everybody was feeling like a victim. This book today, The Blueprint and helping leaders build this foundation in a way, I should say, in a way that fits into their cockamamie life because they have no time to do this, right? They have no time. So whatever you design has to be designed by somebody who's lived it and been through it. And you got to be able to do it in a week. You got to be able to get up and running. You can't go to Harvard and get a master's in business administration or Stanford uh, to do this work. You got a job to do. You got a family to raise. You got commitments. Uh, so we designed this to help you build the foundation you need so you can lift your leadership in a way that works for you. Any other way is a fool's errand. It's just it's just a fool's errand. If you're going through all these checklists and all these books written by all these people who never led anything and you're just trying to check the box and I'm going to be more like this and I'm going to be more like that, you're, you're selling yourself short. You have everything inside of you you need to be an effective leader. You just got to tap into it in a way that speaks deeply to you. And that's what this work is all about. I'm sorry. I get on my soapbox every once in a while, but I can you tell I'm passionate about it? Yeah, I was going to say soapboxes are great when it comes to, to interviews because people are drawn in by passion when it's a topic that they aren't necessarily um, gravitating towards on its own. You, it's, it's easy to seek out things you're interested in, but, but passion can be a, a great way to get people engaged. Um, I want to I tease my next question for the, the second half of the interview for our, our Patreon members, and, and th that question is, at, at what point did you 
in your leadership journey get to a, a moment where you thought that something you were thought where you were doing right, something you, th- you were you were sure that this was the right way of doing it. And you had kind of like this, oh, oh my gosh, I, I'm not doing this right. I need, to, I need to change something even if I don't know what it is yet. And we'll answer that in just a minute. But before we do, um, give, give our listeners an ask. What can they do? Is there, where, where would you like them to check out your book or your website or, or something like that? If you go to my website, ConantLeadership.com, uh, uh, that will explain the platform I'm talking about. And we talk about the Blueprint book, Six Practical Steps to Lift Your Leadership to New Heights. I'm the author, along with my co-author, Amy Fetterman, who is editor of Conant Leadership, all of our materials. And uh, that's where you go to learn about the book and learn about the journey. And uh, I would say we are relaunching the book exactly a year. We have a Groundhog Day theme because we're relaunching it the week we started canceling everything a year ago. And we're kicking off the launch with a – with a uh, a blueprint leadership summit starting the second week of March, March eighth, and we have uh, I have uh, several guests on the first on I do it an hour and fifteen minutes each day. The first day is with Stephen M R Covey and Meta Norgard, who wrote the forward and the afterwards to the book, and who I've known for a long time. And Stephen M R is world class expert on trust. And Meta Norgard is a world-class teacher and expert on higher ambition leadership. Day two is with Bill George, a Harvard business professor and former world-class chairman CEO of Medtronic. Day three is with Deanna Mulligan, who just wrote a great book called Higher Purpose. She's one of the 50 most powerful women in business. She was chairman CEO of Guardian Life Insurance. Day four is with Indra Nui former chairwoman and CEO of PepsiCo, one of the 100 most influential women in the world, and talking leadership with her. And then day five is we have a power panel of three people who have actually been through the blueprint process, and they're going to talk about what worked and what didn't work for them. March 8th through 12th, you can sign up at the website. You can learn all about it. You can learn about the book there. That's great, Doug. Thank you. Uh, and with that, it brings us to the end of this portion of the interview. Make sure you visit Hacking Your Leadership Podcast Patreon site in order to hear the rest of my interview with Doug Conant.